Uh, welcome everybody to this session on artificial intelligence and in emerging technologies. Uh, I would like to introduce our chairperson, Margareta Colangelo. She is the co-founder and CEO of a company called Jitarium in San Francisco. She has over 30 years of experience having worked in the Silicon Valley, especially with all the IT companies working with future tech and AI. She has published a lot of articles and uh, she has a lot of writing to her name and research. And she also sits on the advisory board of AI for Precision Healthcare. So I would request uh, Margareta to please uh, uh, come over and to be the chairperson of this session. Over to you, Margareta. Okay. Okay, now it's working. Hello and welcome to the AI and Emerging Technology session at Comdex um, AI. I'm Margareta Colangelo and I'm with you tonight from San Francisco, California. And I'm very happy to be taking part in this session on AI in Emerging Technologies. Um, I'd like to thank our hosts in Oman for inviting us all to join and being so welcoming um, they've been very gracious to us um, in the, at this conference, and I'd like to thank them for that. Um, we have three speakers tonight. We'll start with um, Mr. Hari Nair. He's the CEO of Gadion Systems, and he's in India. And then we'll, um, ha we'll hear a presentation from Hammond Shatkut. He's the team lead of systems engineering at Cisco in Oman. And then um, I'll be the third speaker and I'll be speaking about um, how AI is being used in healthcare. Um, so we, we can start now with Hari. Hari, would you like to give your presentation? Yes, of course I can do that. Let me try to enable my video or oh, it says that I can't share my video. Okay. I think you may have to make me as the host. Yes, Margaret, if you can make him as the host, uh, there's a small glitch at this, and then we can take turns as a host. Okay. And uh, where do I do that? In the participants, when you click on the oh, participants, you will see panelists. Oh, I see. Okay. You'll see hurry and okay, make I him a it. host. Okay, here it is. Okay. I think you're a host now. Okay, thank you, Margarita. Can you see my face? Yes. <laughs> Very good. So let me try to pull out my presentation. And I will share my screen also. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Who can share? Only host. It is asking me some advanced sharing options. I selected only host. Is it is it visible now? Not yet. I am having some trouble in sharing my screen. Never used to be so difficult. Pro probably so do, you, do you see the button at the bottom that says share screen? So I could see that, but I press that uh, sharing the screen, but it is asking me some options now. You can say all panelists can share screen and that will allow everybody to share screen. There is an option called share screen. Yes. Then all panelists who can yes. share. This is asking me some question. Who can share? Who can start sharing when someone else is sharing? Yes. Say, okay. Choose panelist. For both the options? For both the options. Okay, I selected that. Yes. 
and then you can close okay. the window and you can start to share the screen okay is it visible now yes if you try again because i am able to share my screen so okay i will again try all pan all panelists all panelists close maybe i will is it visible now no and uh, no okay now it is coming yeah okay now we, now? now we see it now we see it yes very good so good afternoon good morning and good evening or to everyone i am hari nayar i am the ceo of gradion smart systems i am very happy to be part of the comex ai in oman today i will be talking about ai solutions for industries using delphion when i talk about ai it is ai ml and deep learning and everything is inclusive the main topic today i am talking is about what are the various problems we are having in industrial automation or industry 4.0 or iiot industrial internet of things and there are many many problems there and one of the problems i am taking and focusing in today's sessions and we are using a platform called delphion that is an iiot platform from gradion for implementing industry 4.0 solutions in this particular talk i will be covering how can we realize different ai solutions on top of delphion i will be focusing on the electrical motor in the human life as you can see that every phase of our life whether it is factory transportation or food industries or any manufacturing or any of the production facilities there are different type of electrical motors used for moving different parts and motor failure in a production facility can be having a huge impact on the production loss as well as on the operations cost increasing and lot of inefficiencies will be coming into our operations of the factory floors specifically i will be taking this particular topic today and explaining how exactly we can provide a better solutions using ai for predicting the failure of motors that is the topic of discussions i'm just getting into some statistics as you know that every industry has so many rotating equipments which are driven by electrical motors it could be a robot a robot it could be a conveyor belt it could be various uh, in a bottling plant a filling station for filling the food or beverages or liquids in bottles and there are so many different kind of it could be palletizer or depalletizer kind of equipments all those equipments have lot of different moving or rotating equipments and all these equipments are using different type of electrical motors if you take a factory or a or a production line you can see that there will be thousands of such motors with varying capacity it could be from few kilowatt to megawatt kind of capacity as per the statistics in 59 percentage of the total energy produced in united states of america is consumed by the electrical motors and 78 percentage in industrial systems and 90 more than 90 percentage in process industries 
43 percentage in commercial buildings 37 percentage in the home from here you can see the the importance of mortar or ensuring the reliability or working of the mortar during the operation is very critical and you have so many mortars across different uh, different aspects of the human life from the transportation to the manufacturing to the home to the building to the commercial buildings and you can see that, that what is the average cost per hour of downtime you can see here it could be forest products it could be food processing petroleum and chemical metal casting automotive you know various kinds of hourly loss due to downtime in the production line so this kind of numbers depends on what kind of industry you are working but the bottom line is that if there is a motor failure there is a huge loss why if it is happening during its operations failures of motor causes heavy impact in production across industries catastrophic failures of motors are gradual and give away a lot of symptoms over time i think this is a very important point if you really analyze the the failures of motors in those industries you can see that failure even though failure is happening suddenly but there are so many different symptoms it will be giving either that motor will be making a a different type of noise or the temperature more may be high or vibration may be more so many different kind of indications it gives so if we have a mechanism to collect data from these motors during that early stages we should be able to predict the motor failure in advance and try to avoid the unplanned downtime in the production floor prediction based maintenance helps to reduce the downtime of motors and hence save production loss and operation cost moving on to the next slide you can see this is a happy production line and suddenly if the motor is failing in this you can see there is a conveyor belt definitely there is a motor here once a motor is failed you you know that the plant managers and the technicians and maintenance teams comes and try to fix the problem but you know that the revenue is lost or the production is lost and we are trying to come up with a solution to minimize the the revenue loss or the production line downtime due to motor failures let us see how things were done you know traditionally you know that when there is a motor failure happens they collect lot of analysis the transient voltage voltage imbalance harmonic distortions then variable frequency drives like reflections on on drive through pwm signal sigma current operational overloads then mechanical misalignment shaft imbalance shaft loses bearing wear and improper insulation like soft foot pipe strain and shaft work. there are so many different parameters one of the challenges in this kind of approach is that there are so many different parameters you need to measure and instrumenting on a instrumenting these kind of external sensors on a working motor in the production line is not very easy so that is one of the main challenges we are facing in the traditional approach now let us see what are we going to do in this new approach we are going to collect the data and what are the different data we will be collecting we will be collecting the stator current profiling to predict fault conditions we are not talking about vibration data kind of things instead of that stator current the advantage with the stator current is it is very easy for us to measure because if you put a current transformer or some kind of electronical mechanism to measure the current from the starter output we should be able to predict the the current status of the motor and we should be able to predict when likely that, that motor is going to fail it could be an early warning system 
it could be an anomaly detection or it could be a, a, a fault prediction mechanisms. Moving on to the next slide, AI based motor failure prediction, the output stator current is sampled to occur a signature signal using Delphion gateway. Delphion is the platform we are using here to implement this particular solution. We have a gateway device. Gateway device will be able to read the current parameter of the stator current, the output stator current. The current signal is analyzed and monitored for sidebar frequency components that are not ex expected. I will go to the next slide and explain you this. So this is a, a, an induction motor. We are trying to output of the stator current is measured and sample stator current values. We are going to measure this stator current, the current signal and its frequency spectrum is analyzed. And we are using some of the advanced DSP algorithms to analyze these signals. Then multiple signals in varying bands. We are going to try to find out what are the different side bands we are having here. It's, it's like a harmonic analysis, then frequency spectra. Then frequency spectra is from here, we are extracting the features and indicators for early warning signals. We will be feeding this to a fault detection networks. This is the AI and machine learning uh, based networks, and it will be classifying as rotor bar damage, bearing faults, winding faults, and electrical faults. Then of course, we have a, we have a, a visualization to indicate to the operators or the production manager regarding health of each and every motors. In this way, what we are trying to do is that we are collecting the data from an operating motor while it is in operation. We are doing <clears throat> collecting those data and passing to our models and do a basically a classification algorithm here. But of course, before we can push this one to a classification algorithm, it needs to do some of the uh, digital signal processing and some feature identifications. This is all done as part of the edge analytics. So we collect this data from the motor. There is an edge gateway. We will be doing this kind of processing on the edge gateway, then connecting this particular features or, or inputting these features to the learned fault detection networks. It, it's, it's a, a trained model and we will be classifying to various categories of faults. And this is what actually it is listed here. The output stator current is sampled to acquire a signature signal using Delphion gateway. Current signal is analyzed and monitored for sidebar frequency components that are not expected. The low and high frequency information is extracted and used for further to detect early warning indicators for any known faults. The analyzed and extracted signal components are piped into a fault detection engine such as auto encoder network. A fault warning issue pertaining to what type of fault system is able to detect based on the confidence of the model. This is, not, this is where the classification happens. And based on this classification, an operation panel is updated to visually convey and quantify the fault and take corrective actions if required. This is what exactly we are doing. For realizing the systems, we have used Delphion and few sensors to collect this data. And there are a couple of uh, components in the Delphion. One is the sensor module we need to, this is basically a current sensor. You need to have an electrical meter connected from a uh, CT, that is the current transformer. We will be able to sample that data and go through some kind of edge analytics on the gateway, then push that features and indicators to the fault detection networks, and it will be classifying as one of these. Or if you have more, more such faults, we can include that. Moving on to next slide. This is what is the Delphion component. So you can see there is a physical layer. We are collecting the data from this current sensor, we are pushing this data to the 
to the gateway using Wi-Fi, BLE, Zigbee, C-Wave, LoRa, those kind of protocol. Some of the software protocol, application protocol we use are Modbus, Backnet, OPC UA, and Heart. Then once this data comes to the gateway, we do data collection and harmonizations, and we also do the edge analytics here to really identify and extract the features coming from the data. Then that particular model or that particular features is pushed to our machine learning model, which is running on the cloud applications. On the cloud applications, we will be doing the data storage, data analysis, visualizations, and interface for the APIs for the applications. Here, we will be having the AI models will be running here, and the data which is coming, features coming from the gateway to the to the, uh, the, the model running on the cloud, it will be pushed to this one. The model will be written, the classifications, the local display is updated according to that. And of course, once this kind of platform is ready, you can make your own applications, which is running on a, a, a like a web applications, which is running from a cloud server kind of environment. Of course, this particular platform can run from Azure or from AWS, or in some cases, some of the factories are not interested to use the public cloud. It can run it from a private cloud, or it can run it from an on-premises servers also. Some of the main features or the characteristics of the platform is, this is a microservice-based architecture, modularity and interoperability, deployment flexibility like AWS, Azure, and on-premises server, high level of configurability, enabling integration of sensors, devices, gateways for data collection and management, KPIs and business metrics, anomaly detection and handling. One more point I want just to remain you here. This platform can be used for any IIoT application. In this particular example, I am demonstrating this has been used for an AI-based motor fault detection systems. But assuming that you have an another use case you wanted to monitor, say real-time production monitoring needs to be done. Of course, instead of this kind of uh, edge analytics, we will be doing a real-time production monitoring. So that is just an application layer change. Application development to address custom dashboards and reports, APIs for integrate with the enterprise apps and analytics engines configurable to meet industry 4.0 standard. This can be easily upgradable to industry 4.0 requirements. Uh, you know, some companies are already industry 4.0. The other companies who have planned to get into that one, this could be a good platform to start off. Moving on to the, the next slide. So do you have any questions so far on whatever I discussed before I go to other case, other success stories? So this is the, the, the crux of the our solution. Any specific questions? Okay, I will move on. So I'm just listing out few more success stories based on Delphion platform. One of the cases a leading FMCG manufacturer was looking for a solution that will improve efficiency in their production line changeover process for their labeling section. If you see here, this is their production line. There is a labeling section. Whenever they are, whenever they are moving from one product to other product, there is a changeover process happens. They need to manually configure different equipments or calibrate for that particular product. And this was taking a lot of time and they wanted to do implement a solution based on Delphio. You can see what we have done here. Current manual process is time in intensive and hence inefficient with heavy dependency on technicians, skills and performance. 
solution is realized using Delphion framework, retrofitted existing manual readout with a digital scale for the leveler. The digital measurements will flow to an edge gateway via an aggregator. The received data is processed and compared against reference values for each bottle type. This is used to adjust the position in the scale and will display the readout in local HMI, local human machine interface for the technician. Data analytics with the KPIs and dashboards are also displayed. Using Delphion, 80% improvement in their efficiency for the changeover process and 30% lower total cost of ownership by leveraging Delphion. This is what one of the FMCG companies from Malaysia was is using this kind of system based on Delphion today. Moving on to another case study. This is a wine bottling plant in North America in California, where one of their challenges is that this is the capper head. Typically in a wine bottling plant, wine, bottled wine bottles will be coming on a conveyor belt and coming to a circular tray, 32 you know, bottles will be there. And this kind of machines will come and put cap on top of that. In real time, they will be doing, putting this cap, the metal cap plus required threading. What happens is that if this machine comes up with a, a more pressure or force, there could be crack on the bottle, which can increase the rejection rate in the quality check. Suppose if the force or pressure is less than the indented one, then again, the cap may be loose. That also will speed up the oxidization of wine. In both the cases, it is not good for wine bottling. So what we have done is that we have come up with a solution based on Delphion. We created a hardware called a dummy bottle. This dummy bottle looks like exactly like a wine bottle, but there is no wine inside, only electronics and various sensors. There were almost nine sensors inside. And as you can see that one of the bottles in this 32 bottles will be our fake bottle. That bottle will be reading the various sensor values. Based on sensor values, Really displaying this kind of dashboard where operators can see each and every parameter and identify are they in the allowed range of green or are they getting to the danger zone or already they are into danger zone. This is the another use case we have realized using Delphion. Moving on to another use case, electrical power monitoring. This is also a good solution for, for industries. As you know that there will be multiple sources of electricity in a typical production line or a factory. We are enabling a solutions to measure, visualize and optimize the various parameters required for better utilizations of energy in factories. These are some of the case studies or success stories in addition to AI for motor failure analysis and water failure prediction, we have used Delphion for. Any, any questions on, uh, on, on these case studies? Okay, moving on to about Gargion. I'm from Gargion. Gargion is an end-to-end -end technology company pivoted on Internet of Things. We started with Internet of Things and Gadgeon is a 10 year old company based out of different parts of the world. You can see that global presence, local focus. We have two offices in US, one is in Milpitas, another is in Atlanta. We have two offices in Belgium. We have one office in Dubai and we have two development centers in Kochi and Bangalore. Majority of the development happens here and all these offices are majority of business development offices. Moving on to the next slide. In addition to Delphion based AI solutions, we also have other AI solutions for 
EV charger management platform. We have a platform for electrical vehicle charger management. What are the advantages here? EV users allow users to find and reserve available charging stations, payment for charging services through the app, view status and history. And charging station owners onboard chargers to the platform, set the pricing, view the status of the charging station, alert on faults, view the review generated and cost based on electricity consumption. Here also we can add many AI related features to enhance the experience of the EV users as well as charging station owners. One example is that intelligence suggestions to EV owners on the most suitable location to recharge the vehicle during a trip by using information such as EV and its state of charge, loading and route information to predict the best recharging locations. Enhance the suggestions with additional information such as a customer preferences like spending the recharge time at a restaurant, shopping or recreation etc. So we are keep on adding many such AI related features on top of EV charger management platform. These are the other AI activities happening in Gadgeon. Why Gadgeon? We are an excellent track record founded by and promoted by technology veterans, successfully deployed more than 150 projects, proven engineering expertise in end to end solutions. So that's all the presentation from me. Thank you for your time. My questions, please, we can discuss now. Thank you very much, Hari. That was very interesting. Okay, that is good. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you, Hari. Thank you. You are Thank you welcome. very much. So our next speaker is Hamand Shakut. And Hamand is a Cisco veteran and has been with the company for 15 years. He's currently working as a team lead systems engineering based in Muscat, Oman. He has vast experience on mega digital transform transformation projects and supporting the top enterprise customers in the region. He holds Cisco's top certification CCIE and his interests include collaboration in AI. So Hamand, if you can, um, you can share your screen now. Thank you so much, Margareta. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm trying to start my video. Uh, I am getting the same error which uh, Hari was getting earlier. So, okay, Hari, what did you do that worked when you were trying to share your video? Actually, the sharing the video, I think you made me host. I think I yeah. may have to change that. Okay, so I don't have, I think you're a host now because I don't have, can you go in and, and make um, Hamand yeah. host? Let me try to. Because you're a host right now. Yeah, actually, how will the, I do? There that? are panelists uh, in the participants. There's a panelist and their attendees. Okay. If you look in the panelist, you will see Hamad Shaukat, Cisco. Okay, make cost. Yes, please. Okay. I did it. Right. Hamad, Thank you, you so much. Get it? Yeah, Thank can you. you see me now? Yes. yes, we can see you very well. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Comex, uh, for inviting me today and being part of the session. And uh, thank you, Margareta. Uh, for uh, the introduction and uh, great session, uh, Mr. Hari. It was very uh, informative uh, for all of us. Um, as uh, Margareta mentioned, uh, I'm Hamad Shokat, uh, Team Lead System Engineering uh, with Cisco, been with the company for uh, 15 years. And today I'm going to talk about uh, collaboration uh, uh, powered by AI. Let me share my slide deck. I hope it works out.
Can you see the slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we are all set. So I will make it uh, short and sweet. Uh, I will try to wrap it up in uh, 20 minutes. Um, so as I mentioned, Cisco collaboration powered by AI, we call it uh, cognitive uh, collaboration as well. Um, so most of you know about Cisco, but uh, some of those who don't know about WebEx is um, basically it's a market leader uh, collaboration solution. Uh, we have been, uh, you know, uh, innovating in this area. We are, we are known innovators. It, it is the number one platform when it comes to collaboration. Um, it is basically a leader in uh, virtual meetings. And uh, since the pandemic started since last year, uh, we have seen uh, immense adoption, uh, you know, for the remote users uh, and the hybrid uh, workforce. Uh, we have solutions for meetings. We have solutions for video conferencing rooms. And uh, last but not the least, uh, we have uh, contact center solutions as well uh, in terms of customer service. And you can see at the bottom, we are known uh, you know, uh, for innovation, as I mentioned, received multiple awards. Uh, one of the prominent ones is the Red Dot uh, Award, which is like the Oscars of technology. So we are not only bringing um, you know, the right products and uh, the right software uh, to support it, but we are making sure the design and the aesthetics, they are also appealing uh, to our customers. Uh, some of the snaps, uh, we have uh, 600 million users which rely on WebEx every month. Uh, different verticals, um, you know, since last year, a lot of adoption in education, healthcare, um, in, in media, uh, you name it. So we have customers everywhere and the adoption is increasing uh, every week, every month. At a high level, I'm not gonna go into the details uh, because the focus is more around the uh, AI part of uh, our uh, solution set, but this is our collaboration uh, portfolio. So we have a solution uh, for all scenarios. Uh, we have uh, for the desk, we call the desk pros. So these are video conferencing devices which you can put on the desk. Um, it, can, it can be your remote office as well. And you can do video conferencing, share screens, do whiteboarding. And then we have uh, video uh, rooms, which we call uh, the WebEx rooms and the WebEx endpoints, uh, which uh, our customers can use to uh, connect with people all over with 4K high definition experience, do whiteboarding, share their content, and making sure that uh, you know it, it is a secure meeting. And we definitely, there's a lot of uh, regulations around data privacy and making sure that the trust is there in terms of uh, from our customers. Uh, we also have solutions from our, for the frontline uh, workers where in terms of the wireless devices, deck phones, and overall there are uh, you know, uh, great management solutions to uh, support all of them. So talking about AI, uh, so AI as we know is not new. Uh, it has been there for decades and uh, different uh, companies, different uh, you know, areas of technology they have been relying on AI and machine learning to uh, you know, bring in new innovations and, uh, and develop new cases, uh, which develop new use cases, which were difficult uh, you know, uh, before the advent of AI. So you can see in the last uh, uh, couple of uh, years, uh, we got great success in terms of uh, some of you know, the advanced features like uh, face recognition, advanced noise detection, uh, noise removal, uh, speech recognition. So there's a lot of interesting thing which is happening and this is, uh, you know, this is just the start. So, um, and if you see at the bottom, deep learning, which is more around, you know, using the neural networks, uh, algorithms and going really deep into uh, this area. This is something which has uh, given us some exponential growth uh, in this area. When you talk about uh, uh, cognitive uh, collaboration, um, uh, these are uh, the four pillars which we have. Uh, the first one is about the relationship intelligence, is about the people profiles, uh, how they are connected together. For example, you're going into a meeting, before the meeting you will come to know about the profiles of the people uh, who are attending a, a, a specific meeting. Like for example, today, before the meeting, you will get a report that these are the people who are going to attend, these are the professional profiles. How is their organization structure, how they are connected? So, you know, beforehand, you don't need to come and introduce that, uh, you know, uh, about, about yourself. Then second is about audio and speech technologies. Uh, this is the area where we have uh, made advancements in noise removal, uh, speech integration, meeting transcripts. 
Uh, then we have the multimodal bots. So this is uh, voice and text when we talk uh, multimodal. And uh, here we have uh, created uh, some bots, intelligent AI enabled bots like uh, WebEx Assistant, which I will be covering uh, in the next slides. And last but not the least, we have uh, uh, our pillar is computer vision. Uh, this is the area which is giving us uh, capabilities in terms of uh, advanced uh, facial recognition and gesture recognition. So going now into uh, the details of these, uh, I'm gonna talk about first the WebEx Assistant. Um, so WebEx Assistant basically is like bringing an intelligent assistant to work. Um, we have seen uh, consumer assistants which are out there. I'm not gonna take names, but we are all aware. Uh, we have them at our homes, but we really wanted to have the first enterprise ready voiced assistant. For example, you have uh, this meeting in front of you uh, through speech, you can ask, uh, you know, invite, for example, Keith to join a meeting. So you don't need to press anything, which is, uh, you know, after the pandemic, people want things like this, you know, where you can use the speech and uh, give actions. So WebEx Assistant is an instructional uh, AI voice assistant, and you can, uh, there are different use cases which are possible through it. Uh, when we are talking about consumer use cases, you know, they're different, uh, definitely, and it is a very, they're useful things which we do in everyday life, like what's the weather like, play this song, turn on the lights, or, you know, set a timer, you know, after one hour, or remind me to, you know, uh, do some shopping tomorrow. But when we talk about uh, the enterprise use cases, uh, they are totally different. So we have things like, uh, hey, uh, WebEx assistant, can you uh, schedule a meeting for me for tomorrow? And I want these, these participants. Or uh, start a meeting verbally if you are in a room uh, or call somebody. Or uh, now we are having this meeting. I want my AI assistant to take the meeting notes. I don't want to have a pen and, pen and paper and write down uh, you know, the notes and uh, which, which can distract me uh, from what is happening in the meeting. Uh, one of the very interesting uh, use cases is the interaction with expense management um, uh, use case, uh, which we are also working on and it, it has a, a lot of uh, uh, value in the enterprise. Um, so when you're talking about rooms like this, so what a WebEx Assistant does that uh, there is a big word. Uh, so we say, okay, WebEx, join the meeting. So automatically the, the bot will wake up uh, and it will uh, start the scheduled meeting. Or you can ask uh, any other uh, command you want, like start a meeting with a specific person as well. So this WebEx Assistant is based on uh, mild meld technology. It's an open source technology. Uh, it is a leading conversational AI platform uh, that provides functionality for every step of the conversational workflow. Um, so you can see uh, WebEx Assistant is not only about taking instructions, there is uh, speech recognition, uh, there is na natural language understanding, there is uh, back and forth question answering, uh, there is dialogue management as well. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's back and forth, very complex. And these complex inter interactions uh, using natural language understandings with dialogue management and questioning answering make it, make it really, really, really powerful for enterprises. Uh, moving on to uh, meeting transcription, which I mentioned in the previous slide. So we have uh, using WebEx Assistant, uh, using the AI capabilities, it will uh, help you in note taking so it will uh, listen to whatever is being spoken in the meeting, take the useful notes, uh, look for the highlights uh, in our discussion. So for example, if I'm saying, uh, team, we have an action, we have to finish this task tomorrow. So automatically WebEx Assistant will pick the action word and put this action in the action list or the to-do list. So this way you don't need to worry about, uh, you know, uh, the headache of uh, note taking and, uh, and this way you will be more uh, focused and engaged in the meetings. Um, another very uh, useful feature is about real time translation. So imagine you are in a global meeting, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, being streamed globally. And it is in English, but then, um, you know, if you want that to be translated into your native language, so that can be done live. So there is real time 
in meeting translation uh, capabilities and we support uh, you know 100 language so uh, language should not be a barrier you know to get the communications uh, noise removal um, i have been absolutely uh, blown away by uh, blown away by this technology uh, this comes uh, to us from the babel labs acquisition uh, the there have been many, uh, you know, uh, products out there, but this one really uh, sets apart from others. It distinguishes uh, human voice from the background noise using AI. So, so this is the the, the use case. Um, and if you talk about, uh, you know, uh, if you go a little technical, and if you see, uh, there has been there has been some incremental improvement uh, in the last two decades or so, but then until recently. Uh, Babel Labs has really, uh, you know, improved, uh, you know, in terms of the, the noisy input value, which we call technically the specific value, the ITU standard. So it has really, you know, improved and uh, given us uh, a big uh, drastic improvement in this space. And why it is so relevant, you know, since last year, uh, we have been working remotely, the workforce is hybrid, you are at home, there are unwanted sounds, there are home appliances or the typing sound or the dog is barking. So it can distinguish that and it was going to, you know, block all that unwanted noise. And even if you have, if you are in an open environment uh, and if you have multiple people talking, uh, it can even detect that and make sure that uh, that uh, noise is taken out and only the active speaker or, 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 or you know, um, the closest person uh, is heard. And also there are very interesting algorithms where we are enhancing and improving the speech quality as well. And here we are using deep learning neural networks, um, you know, in, in this space. And Babel Labs um, uh, has been a market leader and now is, is part of Cisco. And we have incorporated this technology into our collaboration solutions. Uh, relationship intelligence, um, WebEx graph. So as I mentioned, if you imagine walking into a meeting and you have uh, 10 participants uh, and, and most of them are new participants. So before the meeting, you can have people insights. So who are these people? How is the professional profile like? Um, uh, what has been their experience? Uh, how are they connected? What are their interests? What has there been likes, you know? So you can get these insights. It can be external and it can be inside the organization as well. So for a company like Cisco, we are a global workforce, uh, 70,000 people spread all over the world. We are having meetings locally and internationally as well. And we are getting these insights uh, before our meetings. Um, you know, so for example, this team belongs to the business unit or the supply chain or the techn technology uh, workforce. So this is very important uh, now since uh, this is the new norm uh, where we are going to work, uh, you know, uh, where we're going to have a hybrid workforce. This is something which is very, very relevant and it gives you a lot of powerful insights. Uh, then it also goes on and gives you your own uh, insights about how you, are, you how you have been using the collaboration solutions. Uh, for example, are you a type of person who is relying more on messaging, or uh, or or are you using calls, or you are using meetings? Uh, how is the split between spontaneous versus scheduled meetings? Uh, who are your most frequent connections? Who are the people you are having the most meetings? How's your work-life balance? Uh, we all know that uh, that line has got blurred, uh, you know, since last year, and we have been putting more hours and, uh, you know, into our work and through this uh, remote work thing. So this is good insights at the individual level, and also from uh, a management perspective, uh, they can see how the teams are talking to each other, how is the collaboration happening, um, and how you know they are working towards one goal. So this is again a very very useful feature. Uh, computer vision, um, we have incorporated this into our, uh, you know, WebS technology, which gives us gesture and AI enabled body language recognition. So for example, you're in a meeting and if you just do a, th a thumbs up, uh, it's going to detect, yes, it's a thumbs up and it's going to detect that body recognition. So we want really these virtual meetings to be as good as having in-person meetings. So it is going to, for example, detect uh, a clap, for example, and different gestures. And we are working on making them localized as well because different gestures can mean different in certain countries. So we wanna make sure that we cater to that aspect. 
and all this is enabled through artificial intelligence. Um, another interesting point is about uh, you know returning to office post COVID. This is something which is uh, concerning uh, many of us. Uh, all of us, we want, uh, you know, safety. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, that is considered as a topmost priority. Uh, we need zero touch. So things like uh, speech recognition using WebEx assistant, for example, uh, to minimize our, you know, uh, the touching of the services, of the services. And then we need systems that can anticipate. So that bring in, you know, the, the lovely, uh, you know, uh, application of AI. For example, you're sitting in a room and your assistant can prompt you that, uh, Mr. Hamad, your meeting starts in three minutes. Should I initiate the meeting? And with just a speech command, you can say, yes, please initiate. So these are the things, uh, you know, which we are all looking for. And then uh, we need intelligent experiences as well. So we have a feature called uh, speaker track. So if you are in a room uh, with video conferencing, um, the, the device can zoom into the active speaker. And even if you're moving inside the room, it can even detect where you are and then it will, it can zoom in and zoom out accordingly. So you don't need to manually uh, play around with the camera and uh, do the zoom in and zoom out. Um, moving on, intelligence that keeps you connected. So we spoke about uh, the touchless engagement and the use of speech recognition. We have something called uh, intelligent proximity. So you, when you're walking into a room with you, everybody has a smartphone. A smartphone can detect, yes, there, there's a WebEx room uh, available and you can connect to it. You can make calls through your smartphone. Uh, you can manage the device through your smartphone. And, and then uh, I spoke about the people insights. This is getting more and more important since uh, we all, they didn't get a chance to travel and, uh, and we have been working remotely. So this is more and more relevant to uh, if you're having global meetings such as like this one where we have participants from all over the world, uh, we can get details on who is who, uh, the profiles and maybe, uh, you know, a name tags uh, in front of us, uh, on top of us uh, using facial recognition. <clears throat> uh, intelligent room capacity. Uh, this is one of my favorite features. So uh, we were getting a lot of requests from our customers that yes, we have these video conferencing uh, uh, endpoints in the, in the rooms. Can we build some interesting use cases? So for example, um, from uh, you know, um, uh, the workplace uh, department, they, uh, they will put a certain number of allowed people in a room. So for example, this room can have only five participants at one time due to COVID restrictions. So if that number exceeds, there should be a warning which should pop up on the screen and the, the meeting should not be allowed. So we have also incorporated this, we call it the intelligent room capacity uh, feature. So you can uh, go and configure uh, what is the allowed number of people and, uh, and if uh, that gets breached, uh, then you should not allow the call to happen. So this is only the beginning, as I said, um, this is a, a nice perspective of how uh, Cisco uh, is bringing AI. Uh, we are using some open source technologies as well, giving back to the community. And we feel very excited, uh, you know, uh, that things like deep learning, neural networks, and all this will give us immense uh, capabilities and it will only, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, great progress uh, in, the, in the coming uh, months and years. So with that, I would uh, like to conclude my presentation and I would like to thank everyone for their attention and I hope it was useful for you. If there are any questions, uh, I will be glad to answer them. Okay, thank you, Hamand. Maybe at the end, after all of our presentations, people might have questions. Sure. Um, can you um, pass over the host to me? All right, it's done. Thank you, Margarita. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, now. Can you see my screen? 
Yep. Okay. All right. So um, I'm very interested in many areas of AI, but um, today I chose to talk about AI in healthcare and specifically AI in medical imaging. And the reason I chose this is because there's been so much success using AI in medical imaging in many countries all around the world, and it's relevant for everyone. So that's why I chose it. It's just so... Um, there's been so many um, people who've um, benefited from using AI and medical imaging. So that was my reason for choosing it. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I've worked in software companies in Silicon Valley for over 30 years, and um, I have two software companies right now. One is an enterprise um, software company for stock trading, and the other one is an enterprise blockchain company. And, um, but I'm also very involved in a lot of other areas of technology. Um, and I, the reason I'm interested in technology is because I really believe that emerging technologies are gonna improve the quality of life for everyone all over the world. And we can already see that with some, some applications of AI. Um, and I follow advances in AI, advanced biomedicine, nanomedicine, neurotech, quantum computing, healthy longevity and blockchain. And um, I've published over 150 articles on these subjects. And my purpose in writing the articles is to disseminate um, scientific advancements from scientists I know who are doing research. So that's the, uh, the objective there. So the first um, FDA clearance for using AI um, in the clinic was in 2016. And the company's name was Arteries. And they were the first company to get FDA clearance to use deep learning in a, in a clinical setting. And their application was used to identify serious heart defects in newborn babies. And before this, it took a long time to, um, to uh, read the images, but with AI, they were able to do it in six minutes. And um, it was really a big breakthrough when it happened. And this application is being used today in a hundred hospitals all around the world. And um, it's already been used to um, treat more than 50,000 newborn babies with heart defects. And it's considered one of the top AI solutions. And you know, it's this AI saved the life of many newborn babies. So that's, you know, cause in certain types of situations, timing is very important. And if a baby has a serious heart defect, the difference between six minutes and 36 minutes, it makes a difference. Um, so that, that's, a, and I know the guys who founded that company and they, um, the reason they did this is because they realized how outdated all of the um, the equipment was to, to to identify defects, so they just they they started the company because of that because they saw a need. Um, so that was 2016, and in the time since then, there have been many applications of AI in medical imaging. Um, but why do we need to use AI in medical imaging? The reason is because there's a global shortage of radiologists. And two thirds of the people on our planet do not have access to radiologists. So four billion people, if they have a medical, um, you know, emergency, they can't go, they can't go to a radiologist. So it's a lot of people are, um, you know, suffering because they don't they don't have access to a radiologist, um, and it's there's a very big shortage right now and it's not likely to change because it takes 10 years to train a radiologist. So um, AI can really help us with this problem. Um, and you know, according to GE Healthcare, over 90% of healthcare data comes from medical imaging, but over 97% of medical images are not analyzed because there's not enough uh, radiologists to analyze them. <laughs> so there's a lot of data that could help people to improve their health and help doctors to take better care of their patients, but there's just, there's not enough radiologists to read these images. 
So this is a map of the world and it shows how some countries have many, many radiologists and some countries have very few radiologists and some countries have no radiologist. Um, you can see that Spain and the United States have the most radiologists and then you can see other ones, but I actually have some interesting data about this because I, I did a lot of research in this because I was so surprised at the, the difference. So on the entire continent of Africa, if you remove Egypt and South Africa, there were only six pediatric radiologists on the entire continent. That means if a child has a, an issue and they have to have a medical image taken, on the entire continent, there's only six people who can read that image, which is really shocking. Um, in Ni Nigeria, there were fewer than 60 radiologists for 190 million people. In Mexico, there's only about 4,000 radiologists for 130 million people. Even in Japan, there's only 36 radiologists for every million people. In Liberia, there's only two radiologists and 14 African countries have no radiologists at all. Um, but in one hospital in Boston, there are 126 radiologists in one hospital. So that just shows you that, that there's, there's this huge difference um, in you know, having access to, to radiologists and AI can really change this. AI can really um, make things better for the countries that don't, don't have radiologists. Um, so AI will help increase access to care in places where radiologists are inaccessible. And AI has the potential to enable anybody who has a smartphone to have access to healthcare. And this is really important in many areas. In rural areas, it's important in um, islands throughout the Pacific where there are no hospitals, no clinics. Um, it's important in the developing world. And it's also important to, in places like Antarctica. Um, there's 4,000 researchers working down there. Um, the crew on the International Space Station can use AI to read their um, images. And um, when we start sending people into space, they can also use AI to read their images. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's really going to be helpful to, for us to advance a lot of things. Um, and what, what people need in many of these um, AI applications is just a smartphone. And right now, 62% of the people in the world own a cell phone and it's growing. So that's, it's really, it's, um, it, it can really, really help people who do not have any hospitals because so many people do actually have a cell phone now. Um, even in the UK, um, over three, 300,000 medical images um, weight over 30 days to be read by a radiologist. So if somebody has a serious problem, they have to wait 30 days and if it's, that is just really not acceptable. Um, using AI can help improve efficiency and reduce delays in identifying abnormal images. So the doctors know which cases to focus on. And this is most important with chest x-rays and brain imaging um, because time is really critical. And 40% uh, of all diagnostic imaging performed world, worldwide are images of the chest. So there's a whole group at Stanford University that's actually use, um, designing algorithms and testing them just for images of the chest. And um, one of the reasons that AI is, so, is uh, exceeding the abilities of human radiologists is because they evaluate exhaustively. And they're very, very accurate, but also they, they do it 24 hours a day. So they're very, um, they can evaluate much more than a human can. And um, automated assessments by algorithms are more reproducible and less subjective than humans. Um, so that's important. And, um, in study after study, AI algorithms are more effective 
and efficient at identifying disease in medical imaging than humans in many areas. And this is even five and six years ago, AI was um, exceeding human radiologists in some areas like the eye, the lungs, um, breast cancer, uh, dermatology. Um, so it's, this has been going on, this is, they've, they, the AI was advanced even five years ago. Um, and, and AI algorithms can read images in minutes versus hours that it would take a human radiologist. And a lot of the algorithms have up to 99% accuracy and very few of the humans have that type of accuracy. And um, AI can also analyze many pathologies um, from one medical image just using one algorithm. For example, um, a group at Stanford has an algorithm can, that can look at one chest x-ray and check for 14 different pathologies. And um, the people who are working on that team at Stanford um, have, have published some really interesting data about that. And it takes, um, on average, it takes radiologists four hours to read an image, but the algorithm can read it in two minutes with the same accuracy. Um, and in China, um, a group used AI to screen for over a thousand diseases from analyzing the image of one eye with 97% accuracy. So that's fantastic. And they're also using that in India. Um, Google has an, an algorithm that they've used in India to screen people for a, a, a disease, an eye disease that can make people go blind. And so it's been really successful in screening out anybody who could possibly um, be, you know, have this disease. And then the, um, the eye doctor can look at those people and it can really help get the people who need help to the doctor sooner. Um, this is an actual picture of doctors in Africa who would go in the last couple of years even, would go to treat people in rural places and there's no internet in these places. So they would have to drive a truck and carry an x-ray machine to the rural areas and then buy an expensive PC to do all the AI compute. But just in the last few months, Fujifilm has come out with this machine, which is a portable x-ray machine with embedded AI models in it from NVIDIA. And so this way they can take this little machine, do x-rays in rural areas, and they can actually, the AI will give the clinicians in the field advice and they don't need any um, internet. And it's, it's a really amazing. This is a, a, a incredible portable machine. That's fantastic. Um, this, the reason I'm showing this is because this is the, the first AI Precision Health Institute ever in the world. And it was founded in, in um, Hawaii about four years ago. And I'm on the advisory board of this institute and I've been involved with it before it was even founded. And they're doing th th some of the most breakthrough AI work in the world. And it's, um, they're having so much success. And since I'm, I live in Hawaii half the time, I get to see all their advances and breakthroughs. So I was gonna um, share some of it with you because it's very interesting. Um, so this is the inside of the AI Institute. And um, they have some, they have many, many AI experts who work here. And um, the, the reason that they need to use AI is because biomedical research is generating massive amounts of data and the amount of data exceeds the limit of human analysis. So AI is helping them look at massive amounts of data. Um, and the, the thing that the uh, scientists in Hawaii are focusing on are in disparities throughout the Pacific with people who have very little access to healthcare versus people who have very good access to healthcare and trying to um, even that out. And uh, this, the, the hospitals in Hawaii are state of the art. They're the most advanced hospitals you can believe, but they're trying to 
make it so the people who live on islands in the Pacific who have no hospitals, no doctors at all, can get access using AI to the to all of the algorithms and the doctors in the hospitals in Honolulu. And um, the a AI has already made a lot of advances in computer vision and speech speech recognition, natural language processing, and all of those are being used at, at the AI Institute. They're they're applying these same advances, and um, they're used. They're mainly interested in um, understanding what are the cancer risk factors so that they can figure out who's at risk before the people actually get sick. Um, and they found at, in their institute that many of their algorithms already surpassed human performance doing many things, I mean, four years ago. Um, so the AI is doing an incredible job. Um, you know, the, the hardware that's needed for, the, for all of these, um, very advanced um, AI applications is it's incredible hardware. And so they built in Hawaii, they built this $40 million center for this. And I've been inside and it's incredible. And so this can serve over 2000 um, islands throughout the Pacific and it, everything can be done remotely. And it's just this, it's the, uh, it's all, it's incredible hardware. This is the inside of the building I've been in. Um, it's incredible. And um, everything in this building is um, state of the art. And it's um, the people are the most highly trained and the, um, and the hardware is cutting edge. And it's just so exciting because it's all going to help people who before had no, no health care at all. So it's, this is not for, for the people who live in Hawaii, it's for people on all the islands throughout the Pacific. It's amazing. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a huge disparities um, um, it, around the Pacific islands in terms of healthcare. So Guam, which is located 4,000 miles to the west of the Hawaiian islands, has um, over 500,000 people and they're spread out over two, over 2,000 islands. And um, there's a very big problem with people getting cancer on these islands and never getting care. And 90% of the cancers are diagnosed in the latest stages where nothing can be done. And the reason is because nobody can go get a mammogram or nobody can go get a, an ultrasound. Um, people can't even visit a, a doctor because many of the islands are so small that there's no nurses or doctors on many of these islands. And they're so far away that nobody can get to a place that has a hospital. So it's really one of the most serious situations in the world. And um, people are really suffering. So um, the AIPHI, the AI Precision Health Institute, um, they're using AI to um, to go, they partnered with Guam and they actually go out, their scientists go out to these islands with portable devices to collect data from people. And then they, all the data goes back to Hawaii and they're, they're all, they use AI to analyze those images. Um, and the devices are very fantastic because they're all very small and they're inexpensive and they've um, sent them all throughout the islands. And this could be replicated anywhere. This could be replicated in Africa or anywhere. And they're, they're also testing them to go into space. They're working, they partnered with NASA. So the, the, the um, devices that they use to collect the data, to, to collect the images are really interesting. Um, so since 2003, the University of Hawaii and the University of Guam have worked together to try to address the health dispar dispar disparities throughout the Pacific. And they, they do a lot of training. They um, do research to find out why some people are more at risk than others. And they, um, they do a lot of community outreach. And um, a, they're, they're, they, are, they have been using AI for a few years to analyze the medical images 
collected from people in um, Hawaii. And it's interesting because this cancer center in Hawaii is the only cancer center in the United States that addresses cancer disparities and um, you know the impact on underserved populations, which is, this is the only cancer hospital that's working to try to address that, which is, I was very surprised when I found that out. Um, so the AIPHI is known worldwide for using AI, machine learning, and deep learning to extract more cancer risk information from medical images. And they use all kinds of different um, devices to take the images. Some of them, you don't even have to sit down. You can, I've, I've tested out all the devices. You can just stand in the center of the room and um, they can take optical images of you. And those are the devices that, the, that NASA is testing. So NASA is testing these devices so that when astronauts are in space, they don't have to lie down on a table or anything like that. They just stand there and the, um, the optical images are taken and the AI is constantly assessing them. And what the AI is looking at is the body shape because when people get sick, there are very minute changes in body shape and the ratio of different parts of the body to each other, like the ratio of the neck to the arm or the ratio of the wrist to the ankle and just different things like that. And the AI can assess that and you don't even have to you know, lie down on a table. You could just be standing there. It's very interesting. Um, and, um, so, and the scientists in Hawaii are mining biomarkers and they're using really advanced techniques. Um, and they're gonna be publishing some papers on that in the next few months. Um, and so one, I'm going to show uh, on my presentation, I'm going to show you one device that I've actually seen that's used instead of mammograms. So many, many women get cancer in the Pacific Islands and they they never get mammograms because their mammograms are very expensive machines. So they have designed this little device that fits in a little case that you can see in this picture that not only works as good as a mammogram, it works better and it has no radiation <laughs> and it's very inexpensive. And so they're using this, um, they, you, you use this with an iPhone and you gather information and it's actually better than an iPhone. So, I mean, better than a mammogram machine. Um, and also you don't need a doctor or a technician to use it. Anybody can use this device. And um, it was designed so that people who live in a rural area without nurses and doctors can still get screened. And then if the, and it's just a yes, no, the device it gives a red light or a green light. So anybody could understand it. And if it, if it gives a, um, if it finds that there's a lump, then that person goes to a doctor, but it just helps people to know if they're sick at all. And um, on this, image you can see on this uh, graph, you can see that this inexpensive, inexpensive small portable screening device actually does more things than a huge expensive mammogram machine. So it's, it's, it, the, it's not as though they're giving the people um, infer, inferior devices, it's better than a mammogram. Um, so, and then when this device is used, um, in the um, islands, and there's other devices too, I'm just showing you one, uh, then all the images are sent back um, to um, Hawaii where they are the same algorithms that are used to check people who live in Honolulu are used to check someone who lives in Guam or any of the small islands in the Pacific. And these same algorithms could be used anywhere in the world, which is, this is something that I really like about AI is that there, if there's one great algorithm to look to find liver cancer, or kidney cancer, or, or skin cancer, the, somebody who's in San Francisco can use the same algorithm as somebody who's living on, on an island in the Pacific. They, and, they're, and the same doctor can, um, can, can you know, look over what the AI has done. Because this is th what these algorithms do is they augment the doctors. So the AI helps the doctors find the images that need to be looked at and need priority. 
So all these, these really, really experienced doctors in Hawaii can be alerted to which cases really need help. And then they'll fly people to Hawaii to get treatment. Um, and so I've written over 150 articles on AI and healthcare in many areas, in, um, in AI for drug discovery, um, nanomedicine, uh, messenger RNA. I've, I've just, I've, I've, I'm very interested in using advanced technology. So I've written over 150 articles. And if anybody's interested in reading more, you can just go to my website or read them on LinkedIn. But I publish an article every week. And I generally only write articles if I've been to the lab and I've met the scientists who are doing the work. Once in a while, because of the pandemic, I haven't been able to go in person, but I'll Zoom with the people and I'll read their papers. So it's um, everything I write, I know it's le it's legitimate science. And I know that the, the, uh, the, the even though the breakthroughs seem so um, shocking, I mean, a lot of the things I write are shocking, um, but I know that the, these are very um, reputable scientists who are doing this. So it's, um, some of, the, some of the information is very, very interesting. And, and, you know, most of the time when AI is used in healthcare, there's other advanced technologies being used at the same time. So AI and um, a nanomedicine or AI and blockchain. Um, so there, um, it's not as though it just, it, it, there's a lot of emerging technologies being used together and it's really exciting. And so that's the end. Okay, so let's see. So maybe we can now, let me close this. Maybe we can, we can now um, have a little discussion. Do you, um, Hari and Haman, do you, would you like to uh, turn on your videos? It seems, uh, Margarita, I think, uh, I think maybe only you can have the video. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but it okay. was a um, great, uh, so what you want great presentation, uh, Margarita. Very, very, very informative for all of us. Yeah, it's, it's uh, really an eye-opener. I'm, so I'm so excited by all the advances. And, you know, so many times when you talk to people about AI, a lot of people are afraid of AI or they think AI is, is so bad for humans, but I have, I've met hundreds and I really mean hundreds because I've been involved in AI for 30 years, hundreds of scientists who are doing things that are improving many people's lives. And just those 50,000 babies whose lives were saved. I mean, those are day old babies. They're one day old. And the fact that that AI really made a difference in their life. And, you know, I don't think most people in the world don't realize that AI is actually being used in the clinic and it's FDA approved. I think a lot of people think that that's years away, um, but there's a lot of AI that's, you know, people are probably being, their, their images are analyzed with AI and they don't even know it, you know? So, um, I, it, and I also think it's important and I'm interested to, th to know what you two think about this. But I think it's interesting. It's very important for students, pe people who are students right now, to realize how many positive, incredible things are happening with AI. So it might entice them to study science and um, technology, and um, you know, work in this area because it's such an exciting area. And if somebody really wants to make an impact on people and benefit people and benefit a huge amount of people, they should study AI. Because <laughs> there's, you know, you, using AI, you could really help the most amount of people. Um, so I really, I think it's, um, it's important to tell students in high school and college um, how much AI, what's possible with AI, and how much, it, how much potential there is using AI to help people. So, and um, I, what, what do you think about that, Hamand? Do you think it's... Um... Yeah. 
I mean, don't that's, you think it's a, it's a, and in not only in healthcare, but in everything, in education, in yeah. finance, in every, everything. Yeah, no, definitely. I think the perspective which you have brought today uh, has, has a very positive uh, impact to, to the whole world globally. And sometimes AI has a perception, you know, where things go negative and, you know, there are a lot of conspiracy theories going on as well. But uh, the element which you have brought today is very, uh, you know, uh, has a positive impact. So, Margarita, we have a couple of uh, students, young graduates on the call as well. And, mm -hmm. and with your experience and what you have covered, uh, it's not only medical, right? There are a lot of uh, different fields and there's an intersection of different fields. So how, uh, you know, students from here, uh, they can be, they can play an active role in this field. And, uh, and how they can uh, enable themselves in, in the different areas so they can ha you know, have be more effective and they can develop some useful uh, innovations in the future which can have the similar impact like what you've shared. Yeah, well, do you, I don't, do you know if, um, you know, so I know that I live in Silicon Valley and so Berkeley and Stanford both have AI classes and they also have blockchain classes. Um, and I'm not sure what it's like in other places in the world, but obviously in Boston, there's a lot of colleges that have it. But I think students should, if, should, when they're, they should go to their dean and say, are there any classes in AI? Or are we planning to have classes in AI? And suggest it. Because no matter what industry you work in, they're going to be using AI. So I think, um, you know, even in architecture, in construction, in uh, maritime, obviously in automobiles, <laughs> you know, AI is going to be used in every area. So I think, um, you know, students should really um, study AI, but also um, have domain specific knowledge. So I think, um, you know, if somebody only studies AI, then they'll it's like when you learn programming, you know how to program, but you don't know what to program. So yeah. you have to have some domain specific knowledge too. So it'd be really interesting if a student studied like bio biology and AI. See what I mean? So that yeah. they could really, because those are two very complicated fields, but if you could have, or, or finance and AI, see what I'm saying? Yeah. It, if students yeah. um, today study um, AI and then an, a domain that they're interested in, that they would be very valuable. And the, and they, the minute they graduate, they'd be able to get a job. Yeah, you know? I definitely agree. I think that vertical uh, element has to be there. Uh, on top of that, they can uh, develop themselves in the field of AI. Uh, Margarita, there's a very interesting question uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, have you seen the use of AI being used to uh, fight the pandemic uh, and, and fight COVID. So have you seen some work going on into that? Yes, and I started um, monitoring that on January 21st of 2020. <laughs> so on January, two days before Wuhan was closed down, I was monitoring this and I actually stopped all my other business doing other things and I only focused on COVID and AI for all of 2020. And I wrote, um, I, every, I, I summarized two research papers a day and I wrote um, hundreds and hundreds of, oh no, I wrote a thousand articles on COVID research and mm -hmm. most of them used AI and 10 million people read the article. So yes, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And it happened early. The interesting thing is if you go back and read my articles from before February, you can see that um, people in China who worked for NVIDIA were already taking um, AI algorithms that prior to COVID had been used just for tuberculosis or um, you know bronchitis, and they tweaked the algorithms to be able to identify COVID. And this was in January of 2020. So yes, they were using all the AI. I was I sent emails in January to all my friends around the world in India and in in um, in China, all around um, in Russia, everywhere. And I said, "Are you all using AI to try to fight COVID?" And everyone was. So yeah, they 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 COVID was was um, AI was used. In fact, a friend of mine who's speaking 
at this conference um, in Oman on Thursday, he was the first, he's the, he owns the, well, he's the CEO of the most successful AI for drug discovery company in the world. It's called In Silico Medicine. And in January, we, um, we talked about this. We had the same conversation that you and I are having now. And he um, said, we've got to get, we've got to bring all the AI scientists from around the world together. And he got 4,000 scientists to collaborate and to um, look at current you reusing current drugs so finding current drugs that have already been approved that could be repurposed to potentially treat covid but also finding new drugs and they started that in january of 2020 so yes it's um ai was definitely used and it's not it's not only f for um covid it's for all uh, other future pandemics too so yeah ai is, has been really helpful Right. And uh, for the people, if they need to share your uh, articles and they have to uh, read the articles, so they can just search on Google or there are some, you have a website? Yeah, either they can just um, go on to put, put my name, Margareta Colangelo, or they can just go to my website. It's just www.margareta.com. And right. I've got all my articles there. And or they can go to LinkedIn. And they're, they're, the articles are, um, I even wrote one yesterday. Um, and every article is about a breakthrough or a brand new advance that has just been announced. Um, so it's, they're pretty exciting. Like just yesterday or just on the, tw just two days ago, the, uh, the European um, um, regulatory agency gave a CE mark to a brain computer interface for the first time. <laughs> so there's like a little implant that goes in people's, it gets it, it is implanted in someone's head and it's a brain computer interface, just like from science fiction. And it's been approved. I just wrote that article two days ago. So that's, um, right. yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 something that we have to remember that's really important is that things are happening really quickly. And it's not going to be a year before breakthroughs happen. Breakthroughs are happening every day. Yeah. And um, this is just going to happen more and more. And, um, you know, as we're, we're in the run-up to the singularity right now, and even if the singularity is 10 or 20 years away, we're definitely in the run-up. And yeah. things are happening really, really quickly. Um, so that's why it's really important for people to start reading things. So when they start, when um, advances happen much more rapidly, they're acclimated, you yeah. know, because in the past, 10 years ago, you'd get one advance, you know, one announcement a month. Now it's going to be, you know, big announcements in the day. I mean, I know of announcements that are going to be made in July, huge announcements. So I think it's, um, I think everyone should start reading about science <laughs> and everyone should, um, should, um, you know, prepare for big announcements about breakthroughs in science and technology. Yeah, great. So I will just take one last question uh, from the audience. Um, there's one question uh, already. There is a gap, uh, as you mentioned, Margarita, in terms of the developed and the developing nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the advent of AI, the gap is increasing. You gave the example of Africa and uh, the number of radiologists there. But we have seen things in US with AI and the advancements which are happening with uh, the electric cars, with the medical and with the research. This gap is going to increase. So what are your thoughts on this ever increasing gap and, um, and the human resource development in the non-developing countries and how it can impact the other parts of the world? Well, you know, most of the scientists who I know who live in San Francisco are from other parts of the world. <laughs> So all of my friends are from India or Russia or China, um, and they're um, so they're. It's like it's not, all, most of the AI scientists are from other places, and they want the algorithms that they're developing, whether it's in cars or in um, healthcare, or even in blockchain, um, to um, to be shared with everyone. Uh, you know, I think that there is an idea that uh, technology is a, is you know, for billionaires in Silicon Valley, but actually it's not. So most of the people who um, 
that the smartest people I know who are working with AI want it to improve the lives of everyone in, in the entire world. And I think they're going to really work on that. I mean, there's, there's many, many unbanked people in the world, in India and in Africa, and many of them are women. And uh, we want all of those people to be helped. And I think that there are advanced technologies are going to actually be something that can help um, people in the developed world. I think actually people in the developed world are going to benefit from blockchain, from AI, um, from a lot of the new technologies. So it's not, it, there's, there's a, there's, there's a very, there's a, a general sense that this should be shared with everyone. And also um, every time I talk to a scientist who's on the, you know, uh, doing clinical trials using AI, I always say, when will this be available and how much will it cost? <laughs> and a lot of these, um, because of AI, a lot of these uh, treatments will, will be affordable. Um, yep. So, you know, right now, medical treatment is extremely expensive, um, even for people in the United States and also for older people who are on, um, you know, strict budgets. Um, and those are some of the people who need treatments the most. So, uh, you know, a lot of the AI scientists want to make the treatments uh, affordable so that everybody can have access to them. Great, great, great answer, Margaret. Uh, very, very informative. Uh, Sadiq, uh, do you want to wind it up from here? Yes, uh, sure. I will do that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Margaret. Uh, for the wonderful presentation uh, you have done today. Uh, in fact, I believe all the attendees today are very excited to know more. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to invite them to join the 3rd of June AI in Healthcare, which uh, you would be uh, chairing and uh, you have helped us get a lot of international speakers. So the, the people session. who are speaking on that panel are the top people and the head of AI for drug discovery in Saudi Arabia and the founder of the best A AI company in the world. And they're really excited to speak at the conference. So, Excellent. you know, people are really excited to speak in Oman. And I think it's really um, I exciting that the in Oman, they, they really are embracing um, AI. Um, in all across all industries. So yeah, so when I invited those people, they were very excited to take part. And thank you also for staying up so late and uh, uh, helping us out with all the... <laughs> <laughs> this is so the much. latest I've stayed up in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's exciting up. and I really, I really want to thank you for inviting me to join the panel. It was really great and it was really, really, um, it was really nice to be part of this panel. Thank you so much, Margareta. Also, thank you, Hari, and thank you, Hamad, and thank you, all the attendees. Uh, with your permission, Margareta, we can close this session now, if unless anybody has to say anything from the panelists. Thank you so much, Margareta. It was very good. It was very informative. In fact, we are also doing a similar kind of AI for cardiology-related uh, sciences because we collect the ECG data, identify various anomalies and arthenias, and that kind of system is being implemented here. But definitely, healthcare is one of the very critical area where we can effectively use AI. I agree with you. It is very really nice great. and and also yeah. in education. And I, I I know there's another panel about that, but you know AI can. I think it's really. I guess we should just close on the idea that. Let's all keep an open mind and be optimistic about the potential of AI. Because I think that a lot right. of people are so afraid of surveillance or something. But, you know, cancer is the enemy. AI is not the enemy. Disease and, and cancer and, and suffering, that's what we're, we want. You know, and I think AI just has so much potential. So I think if, if um, especially young people, if they go into it with an open mind, we can really use AI to really change things and really improve things across all sectors. That is Very correct. Well that is correct. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Comex, for giving an opportunity to be part of this panelist.
Thank you, Hari. Thank you for participating and supporting the event. Really very useful. We look forward to the healthcare, AI and healthcare, which is on the 3rd June. It will be from 3 to 5 p.m. Oman time. And of course, uh, all are welcome for the education session as well. Thank you so much, all of you. And thank you, Margareta. Very special thanks to you for stepping up and uh, taking the chair role for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.